It's one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible. It's found at Matthew 7, verse 1, and says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. It seems to be some people's favorite verse in the Bible, especially people who want to get away with something they shouldn't be doing. You're not supposed to judge me, they say. Many mothers hear this from their adult children. A daughter announces, I'm moving in with my boyfriend. Then the mother says, that may be acceptable among your friends, but it's not acceptable to God, and it's not acceptable to your father and me. And the daughter replies, you're not supposed to judge me. But is that what Jesus meant? Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus tells us to judge correctly. At John 7, 24, Jesus says, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Why does Jesus say in one place, do not judge, and in another place, judge correctly? Let's look at the context. Welcome to Bible Nook's worship service. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Father, we thank you for this privilege you give us to come together as your people to hear your word from the Bible and to lift our voices in songs of praise to you as we sing hymns that glorify your name. We thank you for these blessings and for the joy of knowing that your people gather together all over the earth, whether in person or remotely under varying circumstances, all to receive instruction from you and to praise and honor you and to encourage one another in the faith. We thank you for these blessings and pray your blessing now on the remainder of this service and each one who joins us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in singing, We Gather Together. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus' disciples gathered around him and asked him to teach them how to pray, and he gave them the words that we now call the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer. Let's lift our voices together as Christians have down through the centuries in reciting these wonderful words 
of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This Bible Nook ministry hosts a weekly remote Bible study and prayer meeting at 7 o'clock Eastern Time on Wednesdays from September through June. It's currently on summer recess, but will re resume the first Wednesday in September. Please plan on joining us then. Bible Nook also provides free online resources in the form of websites at a dozen different domain names. At the tobbible.com domain, we provide a free modern Bible translation that's copyright free, the original Bible for modern readers. The Bible we provide at bibleforthendtimes.com can be read online or downloaded for free and features footnotes highlighting and discussing passages on the end times the last days, and other important prophecies. At doorstepbible.com, we provide a free Bible in digital PDF format. It's also available in print like the others, and it has footnotes that enable you to answer Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses when they come to your door. Our AnswerJW.com website provides other extensive resources on that cult, including a free online digital version of the book, How to Rescue Your Loved One from the Watchtower. Our LeftBehind.com, LeftBehindAnswer.com website examines the Bible verses related to that controversial new teaching. Our unversusil.com website explores the roles of Israel and the United Nations in the end times prophecy. Our comefollowjesus.net site offers an introduction to biblical Christianity for non-believers and new believers, and for all of us to review the basics of our faith. And our main website, biblenook.com, provides links to all of the sites I just mentioned and also features lots of other helpful material. Our videos of worship services and individual messages remain available for streaming at youtube.com slash Bible Nook and at facebook.com slash Bible Nook Ministry. These live stream services are aimed at providing traditional worship services for believers who otherwise would not have them because they're confined to the home or because they don't have a nearby church that sings traditional hymns and preaches Bible messages. And they're also aimed at reaching the world with messages proclaiming and upholding the gospel of Christ. We pay Facebook to boost our messages and we pay Google to advertise our YouTube messages, with the result that the thought-provoking thumbnails, a few of which you see here, reach millions of people. Toward the end of 2023, Facebook and Google reported more than a quarter million total views for our message on Israel and Armageddon. A flood of responses and comments, including many from non-believers, and many comments from inside Israel itself prove that this video got many people thinking and talking about the gospel message. The quarter million views reported for that message shows that for a very small ministry with a very small budget, Bible Nook reaches a very large audience. During the year 2023, we received gifts totaling 
$5,326. And we spent $5,875 on web hosting and domains, post office expenses, Zoom, and our call-in conference line. And overwhelmingly, we spent that money on boosting messages on Facebook and YouTube. As you can see, we had a shortfall for the year of $549. But my wife and I were glad to cover that from our own personal funds to keep on boosting messages that were generating so much interest. No one takes any salary from Bible Nook. To maintain our freedom of speech, we have not applied to the government for their approval as a ministry. But all the gifts we receive go directly to the expense of spreading Bible messages. If you're being blessed by this ministry, or if the Lord moves your heart to spend some of your resources on our gospel outreach, you can do so by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the Donate button on the home page, or by sending a check to Bible Nook 214 Onset Ave, Suite 1464, Onset, Massachusetts, 02558. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. When one of you has a complaint against another, do you take your complaint to a court of sinners, or do you take it to God's people? Don't you know that God's people will judge the world? And if you are going to judge the world, can't you settle small problems? Don't you know we will judge angels? And if this is so, we can surely judge everyday matters. Why do you take everyday complaints to judges who are not respected by the church? I say this to your shame. Aren't any of you wise enough to act as a judge between one follower and another? Why should one of you take another to be tried by unbelievers? When one of you takes another to court, all of you lose. It would be better to let yourselves be cheated and robbed. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of his word. Let's join in singing and lift our voices in praise as we sing, Now thank we all our God.
one of the most misunderstood passages in the Bible. It's found in Matthew 7, 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. It's also found in the parallel account of Luke 6, 37. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. It seems to be some people's favorite verse in the Bible, especially people who want to get away with something they shouldn't be doing. You're not supposed to judge me, they say. Many mothers hear this from their adult children. A daughter announces, I'm moving in with my boyfriend. Then the mother says, that may be acceptable among your friends, but it's not acceptable to God, and it's not acceptable to your father and me. And the daughter replies, you're not supposed to judge me. But is that what Jesus meant? In other passages of the Gospels, Jesus tells us to judge correctly what is right. Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? Jesus said at Luke 12, 57. And at John 7, 24, he said, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Let's look at what our Lord actually said in context in the Sermon on the Mount. Beginning in Luke chapter 6, verse 36, Jesus said, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This whole passage is a lesson in how to be merciful, as Jesus introduced it in verse 36 when he said, Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. It was probably aimed at the Pharisees, who were self-righteous hypocrites. When Jesus healed a withered man's hand, instead of rejoicing at that miracle, they were judgmental and complained that it was done on the Sabbath. They certainly weren't merciful. When Jesus healed a paralyzed man and told him to pick up his cot and go home, instead of rejoicing that the man was healed and could walk, the Pharisees were picky and judgmental and told him he shouldn't be carrying his cot on the Sabbath. So our Lord likely directed this lesson at those Pharisees. He continued in verse 37, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. In Matthew chapter 12, we read about an occasion when Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look! Your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus responded to them, defending his disciples. God's law to the Jews prohibited working on the Sabbath. But it was only the Pharisees' opinion that grabbing a handful of grain constituted work. Jesus didn't hold that overly strict opinion, and neither did his disciples. And in his response, in Matthew 12, verse 7, Jesus told the Pharisees, 
If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. So that helps us understand why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. The Pharisees judged his disciples and condemned them. Jesus said they condemned the innocent. And that's what we could find ourselves doing if we go around judging people and condemning people. We could find ourselves condemning the innocent, especially if we're judging without mercy. Jesus said, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Harsh, unforgiving judgment is wrong. Jesus said we should be merciful. Superficial judgment is also wrong, judging by appearances. At John 7, 24, Jesus said, stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Or as the NIV translation renders it, stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. So there in John 7, 24, Jesus tells us not to judge by mere appearances, but notice that he adds, make a right judgment or judge correctly. So there are times when Jesus wants us to judge, and he wants us to make a right judgment, to judge correctly. So let's go back to the case of the daughter who announces she's moving in with her boyfriend, and the mother who responds that sex outside of marriage is unacceptable to God. Is the daughter right to counter with, you're not supposed to judge me? Or is this a case where Jesus wants the mother to make a right judgment, to judge correctly. The answer is found in Titus chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul talks about the role of older women in teaching younger women. There Paul writes, Teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. So according to this passage, older women have a God-given right to train the younger women. In particular, the older women have a God-given assignment to train the younger women to love their husbands and children and to be subject to their husbands. So the mother here is making a right judgment. She's judging correctly. She's just fulfilling her God-given role in telling her daughter that she should have a husband, not a live-together boyfriend. The mother is teaching her daughter what is right and wrong in regard to marriage and family. This is not a situation where Jesus says, do not judge. Rather, it's a situation where Jesus says to make a right judgment, to judge correctly. And the purpose is not to condemn the daughter, but rather to bless her with good advice that will make her happier and more successful. Besides making sure that we judge correctly, we also need to be sure not to judge hypocritically. Hypocritical judgment is wrong. That's why Jesus says in Luke 6, beginning in verse 41, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when you fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's hypocritical to judge other people's conduct when we are doing the same thing we're accusing them of, or when we're doing worse things. 
We've all seen examples of that recently in the news coverage of the Me Too movement. Women began coming forward accusing prominent men of sexual harassment, exploitation, and worse. Some men who were TV show hosts, commentators, or reporters covered the stories and added their own condemnation of the accused, only to have it come to light later that those TV reporters themselves had engaged in the same bad conduct. One prominent state attorney general was a leader in the Me Too movement, claiming to be a defender of women, prosecuting men who abused them. But then he was forced to resign after four women accused him of the same things or worse. So he had a plank in his own eye all along while he was pretending to do something about the sawdust in other men's eyes. Jesus says, first take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And that is the intended result, removing both the plank and the speck. The Lord is not saying that we should let our own faults stop us from helping others overcome their faults, but rather he's saying, first take the plank out of your eye, and then go on to help your brother. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. The Christian church should be a place where both things take place, where the word of God helps us to overcome our own faults, and where we help one another to grow up as children of our Heavenly Father. But outside the church, we may encounter people who don't want our help. In Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount, he notes that right after this discussion, Jesus added, Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. So we need to judge when to speak and when to keep silent. But the most important judging we can do is to look at ourselves in the light of God's word. If we don't work on our own faults, if we leave that plank in our own eye, it will blind us and make us incapable of helping others. In Luke 6.39, Jesus said, Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? If we leave the plank in our own eye, if we don't ask God's help to overcome our own faults, we are then useless when it comes to helping others. We're like a blind man leading a blind man. On the other hand, if we do listen to Jesus, and if we benefit from the lessons he teaches us, then what he said in verse 40 becomes true in our case. A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Our goal is to accept the training that we receive from the Bible, and then we will be like our teacher, Jesus. We will develop a personality like his. So when Jesus tells us, do not judge, he wants us to be merciful, to overlook the faults of others. We shouldn't be like the Pharisees who condemned the innocent. We shouldn't look down on others with a judgmental, holier-than-thou attitude. But Jesus still wants us to judge right from wrong, to judge truth from falsehood, and to judge what is good from what is bad. Jesus said, why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. But people continue to misapply Jesus' words. Aggressive advocates of the gay pride movement come into churches or arise from among the children and grandchildren of church members and they insist on their right to become church members themselves, and maybe even to marry their same-sex partner in the church. 
And when Bible-believing pastors and deacons tell them that this isn't going to happen, they quote Jesus out of context and say, you're supposed to love us. You're not supposed to judge us. That's not what Jesus meant. This is an area where Jesus said we should judge what is right and make a right judgment. In Revelation chapter 2, the risen Christ told the Christian church in Thyatira that he was unhappy with their tolerating immorality in their midst. In Revelation 2.20, he said, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So that church should have rebuked Jezebel. God expects churches to judge such matters. Churches also are supposed to judge who should be in leadership according to God's standards. 1 Timothy 3.2 says, Now the overseer must be above reproach, the husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. So churches need to judge who among them fits those qualifications. We can see the church's responsibility to judge spelled out for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. There we're told that churches and church members have responsibility to judge right from wrong in disputes that involve real people. It says, If any of you has a dispute with one another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? I should explain that the word saints here simply means holy people. In other words, God's people, the church of God. Other translations render saints as the Lord's people, God's holy people, or simply believers. Verse 2 continues, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you appoint as judges even men of little account in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Someday, when we sit with Christ on his throne in heaven, we will judge the world. We will even judge angels, this passage tells us. So can't we judge matters that arise within the church today? If two church members have a dispute, should they take it before Judge Judy? Should they take each other to court in front of judges who are unbelievers? No, this passage tells us we must have people in the church who are competent to judge such matters. It is the church's responsibility to judge disputes among its members. And then 1 Corinthians 6 goes on in the very next verse to answer those who want to bring homosexual conduct into the church and who say, you're not supposed to judge us. It says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, 
nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. So immediately after saying that the church should judge disputes among its members, it goes on to list examples of what is not acceptable. Those who are sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexual offenders, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers. Do we fit that description? Do we see ourselves somewhere in that list? Don't give up hope. Verse 11 says you can change. It says, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When we turn to Christ, he forgives us sin and washes our sins away by his blood that was shed on the cross for us. So when we consider the context, the Bible's message on judging is very clear. Do not judge like the Pharisees did, unfairly condemning the innocent. Do not judge hypocritically when we are guilty of the same conduct or worse, but judge correctly and judge for yourselves what is right in matters where the Bible spells out what is right and what is wrong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful word, the Bible, and the things in it that teach us how to live here on this earth and that give us hope for eternity beyond. We thank you for blessing us with these wonderful things, and we pray that you'll continue to teach us from the scriptures to have your view on matters rather than the view imposed on us by the world around us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join together now in singing, Come Ye Thankful People, Come. God's corner to abide. Come 
mountain tops and angels come, praise the glorious Thomas Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful things in your word that lift us up beyond the troubles of this world and the troubles in our lives and give us a wonderful hope and help us to see that you have things under control, that you are the all-powerful one, and that the time will come when your kingdom will make all matters right, including for each one of us. We thank you for that wonderful hope Pray that now that you'll help us keep your word in our hearts and your gospel on our lips through the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God of with this sheep securely fold you God be with you till we meet again till we meet till we meet till we meet at Jesus' feet till we meet till we meet God be with you till we Our 7 o'clock Wednesday evening remote Bible study and prayer meeting is currently on summer recess and will resume the first week in September. In the meantime, God bless. Keep safe.